Black Panther Wakanda Forever is a mess, which may be an unsurprising opinion to make looking at the title of my video. Before anyone calls me racist or insincere, I'd like to just say for them to hear me out at least, I should probably remind you that this movie isn't all about Chadwick's death. It also has some really dumb shit. I would have forgiven the movie if it was about Wakanda having to try and move on from T'Challa's death and that being the main focus, but there's also stuff that takes that and makes that the sidelines for a while. It would have been an interesting concept to utilize, however they quickly brush over that by skipping forward a year as well. What this video will be about will be me criticizing some odd plot decisions they make in this movie. And while I will be covering how they handled Chadwick's death, this video will be mostly focused on criticizing the plot. So without further wait, let's talk about my problems with Wakanda Forever. I guess I should start with the elephant in the room, or maybe I should say the underwater elephant in the room. That being the Atlantis bullshit. Never once in the MCU have the Atlanteans ever been mentioned. But for some reason, there are a lot of them who just have never been spotted, at least on camera. They've never once been mentioned in passing dialogue, not even with a throwaway line. Even the people in the movie act as if they've never seen them before, despite them being around for so long. And to be honest with you, they aren't exactly subtle in this movie. I wouldn't have minded as much if they were established in Phase 1 or 2. But this is fucking phase 4, and they've never been mentioned once. Speaking of Atlanteans, let's talk about their fucking OP ability, that being mind control. Holy shit is this ability broken, and yet the rules for it are so fucking inconsistent. So in the movie, whenever Atlanteans start singing, that means they're trying to mind control you, which causes you to go into the area which they're in, so they can kill you. Seems simple enough, noise triggers the hypnosis, or some weird opera singing, which means not being able to hear is a good counter. And yet there are multiple times throughout the film where people are indoors or are in range where they can hear the music and just aren't fucking affected. What are the limits to this power? The only way to counter this power is with earplugs, yet how would they know it was the music? If they did know it was the music, then they should already be hypnotized from hearing said music. Also, as a person who wears earplugs on a daily basis, they do not block out all the noise. You can still hear the shit going on around you. All it does is dampen the noise, not block it out completely. So you should still be hypnotized even if you did wear the earplugs. But let's say for the sake of argument that they can't hear. Sure, I'll suspend my disbelief for that, except there's literally the scene at the beginning of the movie where you have been shown them putting on earplugs and the co-workers begin talking to each other fine. So this movie should have been a lot different since the Atlanteans should have been able to succeed in their plans. Another way to break out of hypnosis is by using loud sounds to break them out. For example, in the beginning of the movie, the woman shoots a gun near the hypnotized crew member and he breaks out of his trance. Knowing this, they still don't use this ability when it would easily help them in a lot of situations. Like the bridge battle for example, instead of hypnotizing the one fucking Wakandan there, they instead got the whole army there to take her down. The only reason this happens though is the plot can move forward so Everett Ross can find the bracelet and get imprisoned for his actions. Again, there are multiple times when this hypnosis trick could have been used in a lot of situations, but they never do because that would just ruin the movie's narrative. So remember the next time you see these fucking Atlantean fuckheads on screen, think to yourself if hypnosis will benefit them in that situation in any way, shape, or form. Remember, these creatures have been around for ages, and yet they never take advantage of this ability. What fucking strategic geniuses. Speaking of Everett Ross, let's talk about his fucking mess of a plot in this movie. The only time he was remotely useful in this movie was in one scene. That scene being when he told the Wakandans top secret information. At this point, they should have just left his character there. But no, we need more dumb shit to happen. 
So you know how Everett just picks up the bracelet from the crying scene, and not only does no one see him pick it up in front of many eyewitnesses, but also turns out to be bugged. Why would you feel the need to do that? Who the fuck picks up evidence, places bug on it, and then puts it back where it originally was? Then expects someone to pick it up and use it. That has to be the most convoluted plan I've ever heard. But the stupidity doesn't end there. The bracelet conveniently goes off right next to the detective lady in the car, and she knows he has the bracelet. Instead of this being grounds enough to arrest him for taking evidence from a crime scene, she instead walks away and lets him talk to the people in Wakanda. Fine, I guess they needed evidence that he was in cahoots with the people from Wakanda and proof that he was the mole. So after that phone call, why not arrest him then and there? Wouldn't she be taking too much of a risk by letting him go for much longer? No, because we need our shitty plot twist to happen, in order for artificial stakes and plot to happen, obviously. Everett's entire plot in this movie did not need to happen, and has now made the movie worse for existing in the first place. Now let's talk about the strategic genius known as Namor, or Namor. Namor, contrary to popular belief, is a terrible villain. Where to start on this fucking clown of a villain? First off, how did Namor's guys know where to find Riri? And if they did know, why didn't they get to her sooner? I guess Namor's minions have a fucking GPS built into their brains? Now, I'm aware this next criticism is more or less dedicated to the stupidity of the Wakandans on how baffling their strategy is. How the fuck did Namor's army manage to get past Wakanda's borders undetected? Did they just pull a fucking Loki and manage to get past the borders as they did with Heimdall? We know that Wakanda is in possession of Vibranium, so I have a few ideas on what they could have done to stop Namor from passing through. But before I get to that, you would have had thought their bo water borders underground level would be strong, else you could drive a submarine or swim underneath the borders undetected. No? Shuri knows that Namor's people are water-based, and since Wakanda is on land, and is practically landlocked, the fight should have never even happened. Sure, I could suspend my disbelief into thinking that maybe there's a nearby ocean that has never been established. But wait, I'm remembering something. Ah yes, now I remember. Remember how in Infinity War the Wakandans had the vibranium shielding technology? You know, the thing that kept out Thanos' army for a while? Yeah, that thing. Why the fuck didn't they use it to prepare for Namor's arrival? If you did do that, that means that the Queen wouldn't have died. And they also knew they were coming too. At least, I hope they did, because rewatching the movie twice, I don't remember when Shuri mentioned Namor's people coming to invade. The only time I heard her say that was when one of the people's actions had started a war. So what the fuck happened? Because I see a lot of people saying Namor is a great villain, and he's over here making the most idiotic and contrived decisions I've ever seen. Hell, Namor was willing to go to war over one person in this movie, so imagine what kind of shit he would have been doing during the blip. And before anyone starts to criticize this point by saying, oh, he would have made sure to check what was happening on the surface too. Uh, no he wouldn't. This stuff is only happening underwater for him. Why would he think this is happening on the surface as well? Think about it. If your family suddenly disappeared or died in front of you, would you immediately check if this happened to someone else? And even if he did check, he would probably blame humanity for it. So what the fuck happened during the blip period, Marvel? Are we just now forgetting that period in your films existed? It was a pretty big period, and only bringing it up again when it's convenient for you, so ignoring that blatant plot hole that will remain unanswered in the movies. What else is so bad about Namor's character that makes him such a strategic genius? Well, the fact that he gets beaten by Shuri almost immediately when she dawns on the Black Panther suit. Now, usually this would be fairly normal, a hero defeating a villain in the fight in the third act, but there's just one hair in the soup I can't get over. That being how long Namor has been around, 
Namor has been around for centuries and is expertly trained in combat, and yet Shuri still manages to beat him first try. I get that he's been weakened, but he's literally been around for ages. You would think he would hold his own pretty well despite the circumstances. But anyone who's actually seen and criticised the movie are probably waiting for me to talk about Nemo's dumbest decision in the entire movie. That being in the second or third act, when he had a chance to take over Wakanda, and he didn't. For context, Namor is invading Wakanda somehow, despite it being shown that Wakanda has vibranium shield barriers and is purely land-based, but whatever. Namor is invading Wakanda, kills the Queen, and when given the chance to take over Wakanda, he leaves. What the fuck? He had the chance right there to take over Wakanda, become more powerful, and get as much vibranium as he wants. But no, he just spares them and lets them go. Good job. This is such an idiotic decision, and before I hear any of you say that this was a part of his plan, then let's take a look at what that might be. According to some people, they've theorized that everything went according to Namor's plan. Despite this never being established that this was part of his plan, but sure, let's play along. And that he actually wanted to partner with Wakanda. Um, some minor problems with this plan though, and by minor I mean huge ones. If he knew the fight would happen, how the fuck did he bank on Shuri not killing him? He literally killed his mother, and the only reason she didn't was because of a flashback. Before that, she was kind of dead set on finishing him off. If this is true, then this just makes this movie that much more stupid, and his plan would be the most contrived shit ever. Namor has the chance to get what he wants, that being gaining more power, gaining more vibranium, and a place to expand his base of operations. But no, he gives them a warning, and then fucks off. This decision is fucking broken, and speaking of the scene, let's talk about Namor's boots. And before I hear anyone say it, just because it's comic accurate doesn't make it good. Movies should supply cause and effect for why something exists. I shouldn't be forced to read an entirely different medium just to learn about something. If you want to make something known in your movie, put it in the movie. His boots throughout the whole movie had never been properly established that he could fly. Because you know, he's a person who lives underwater. What is the purpose of boots that can fly when you live underwater? So not only does it make very little sense logic-wise, but it had never been properly established in the movie. So when it does happen, you're just fucking surprised. Like, oh, what the fuck? I didn't know you could fucking fly. Not only that, but when it comes to introducing their origins as to why they live underwater, it's pretty fucking inconsistent. When we see them get turned into blue people, they are dying from no water. Keep this part in mind. That's a surprise tool that can help us later. They then hop into the water, even though that doesn't make any sense. If you are suffocating, why would your first instinct to be to go in the water? That's fucking stupid. Why would you do that? Anyway, we then see them being very inconsistent with this rule. Like, sometimes they can go out of water and be fine, and sometimes they can go out of water and almost die. And then they change this rule by saying that heat kills them. Okay, what are the limits to this weakness? The sun is pretty fucking hot. Shouldn't the sun act the same way the radiator does in the ship later on? Well, I don't know, because their weakness is so fucking inconsistent, it's hard to follow. Also, the way she finds out their weakness is really fucking stupid. You aren't telling me that you are just now figuring out that a water-based creature's weakness is being exposed to something that is out of water for a prolonged period of time. What are you fucking on? Aren't you supposed to be really smart or something? Why wasn't this your first thought as a weakness when you first heard that they were water-based? But one of the things that baffle me the most is the final battle. Her plan relies so much on luck and utter contrivance that it should be a crime for it to work. Remember when Namor invaded Wakanda and no one could literally hit him once? Well, fuck that. Now a girl in a giant robot suit can sneak up on him and get the jump on him. 
Then, when she does get the jump on him, it has to be hard enough for him to fall, and then when he does fall, he has to land on the plane, but that means they would have to time the plane at the exact time he, he's falling, so that means they'd have to time it perfectly. And even then, they don't know his weight and physical attributes, so they won't know how fast he will fall. But that's not all. Not only does he have to fall onto the plane, he has to fall into the hole the plane has in order to fucking deep fry him like a chicken nugget. What the fuck kind of plan is this? Then, the ship is so easy to explode when one or two jabs with a weapon can make it on the verge of destruction, and they say that it can be destroyed at any moment. So it's pretty fucking contrived that Shuri didn't get exploded with Namor, and if the ship did go off, her plan would have never worked. The plan is just so contrived, and should have not worked in its execution. Not a great plan. Speaking of contrivances, this movie is fucking full of them. Chalk to the brim with plot conveniences and contrivances. One example would be how fucking close every character comes to death. For example, when the 17 year old plot device gets knocked out, she drops thousands of feet and almost splashes into the water, which would kill her. However, at the very last second, she wakes up and manages to fly away. Like it or not, this scene is contrived to hell. Whether this flaw affects your viewing experience is a different story entirely. Another example is this woman on the bridge whose name I've forgotten entirely, but nevertheless. She gets knocked out for about two minutes. Now, she isn't on the ground or anything, she's fucking underwater in the ocean, and she should be dead. Even if she did wake up, she would be extremely dazed and confused, and she would be too deep to swim back up in time. So again, both scenes featuring these characters are extremely contrived, and these characters should be dead. Then there are the nitpicks that I have with the film which only kind of bugged me personally. For instance, I think the title cards in this movie are really fucking unnecessary. I should not need text on a screen to tell me where we are. It does not affect the plot in any way knowing which location we are in. So don't use it. They even use it in scenes where it doesn't really matter. There's this scene in the ocean and it cuts to a shot of the ocean with text on screen saying Atlantic Ocean. Okay, thanks movie, I'm not fucking blind. The final thing I would like to criticize is the handling of Chadwick Boseman's death. For the first act, they, uh, they handle it quite maturely and respectfully, but then it starts to feel a bit disrespectful later, and later on, the Queen dies, and we have already been told about Chadwick's death. The movie is dedicated to his death and how the characters are moving on from it, but now it's taking away its focus from Chadwick to the Queen who doesn't fucking exist and is someone we don't care about. It felt pretty disingenuous to take up a character death who died in real life and get some other character death to come in to take their time. And what I might remind you is a movie that was dedicated to him specifically. Not originally, but the script was fundamentally changed to fit the death of Chadwick. Not only that, but I want to talk about the worst fucking ending to this movie, and when I say that, I mean the post credit scene. It is one of the worst things I've ever seen as a post credit scene. So after Sherry stops moaning, this lady comes up to her and says, Hey yeah, turns out T'Challa has a secret son. What the fuck? Why are they pulling this CW bullshit? How is it even possible for T'Challa to even have a secret son? He's the fucking king of Wakanda. I can't imagine it would be very easy to procreate and keep it a secret when you're the fucking king. But fine, let's do a secret sun twist. It feels shitty because it's in the middle of this emotional moment, and it screeches to a halt for the movie to just tell us, Oh yeah, T'Challa had a secret son. That was honestly the final slap in the face for me when watching. But surely there must be something about this movie I like, because I've been criticizing this movie for almost a solid 25 minutes. And yes, there were a couple things I liked. The cinematography for one is one 
of the best cinematography we've gotten in Phase 4. The shots in each scene really show you the tone immediately without having to tell you. At the beginning of the movie, there are these shots that make you feel extremely claustrophobic, and it's extremely effective when setting up the threat for this movie. And there are these beautiful underwater shots later on in the movie, and the way it's shot makes you feel like you're underwater with Shuri. Despite my problems with the movie, I would probably rewatch this movie for just for the cinematography alone, because it's pretty fucking effective. At times, it came close to tricking me into thinking that this movie was good. I wouldn't say every bit of cinematography is great though, there are some moments in the film where some of the shots do look bland and boring, with people in a bland room standing around with a static shot, getting back and forth to characters' faces when the exposition occurs. Those parts of the cinematography were awful, and they make the scenes feel a lot more uninteresting for it. So while the cinematography can be damn near perfect at times, it does feel a bit inconsistent at times in the way it's shot. The music in this movie was pretty serviceable for what it was. I didn't find myself remembering any of the scores that were played in the movie though, although there were some great scores here and there, but again, there's nothing really to write home about. I think my biggest compliment I can give to this movie is that it is an interesting concept for a movie on paper. On. Paper. But in execution, it's fucking baffling. While I did like the first act for this movie, the other two acts really fucking ruined this movie for me. If you like this movie, that's fine, but there are objective flaws that this movie has, and just because it kind of gives Chadwick a tribute doesn't make the movie very good. So I'm going to give Wakanda Forever a 3 out of 10, a good tribute but a bad movie.